Zo, goedemorgen allemaal. De kracht van music zit hem vooral ook uh, um, in, het Engel, in, in de stiltes. Omdat we vandaag een uh, Engelse sprekersgroep hebben, will the remainder of this presentation be in English, right? I have to apologize for my American deflection in the pronunciation of this beautiful language and also to massacre it occasionally. Um, but if you talk about music, the essential part of music is also the moments then when there's no music, the breaks, the pauses, the rhythm. So we're going to talk about that. The, the rhythm, the over rhythm of this symposium, for which I welcome you very much, is uh, four presentations. So we have four presentations about the various components of music and how it relates to society at a global level, uh, at a national level, but also to individuals, like music has all kinds of functions, right? It has a function of experiencing music. Um, it has the function of regulating emotion. It has the a function of expressing emotion, all kinds of things. And we're gonna talk about this this morning um, um, around these four presentations of experts in the field. Um, before we start, I'd like to um, congratulate or um, sort of congratulate uh, Valdi Hanser, who is sort of like the, the pivotal person around which this symposium is organized and he will defend his dissertation, this dissertation, um, at around uh, 1.30 this afternoon. But in the morning we have a more general symposium around this organized by his uh, mentor, Professor Vingerhoots, uh, a dear colleague of mine who I know uh, since, since I did not have gray hair and had lots of hair, uh, lots of hair until here, but that has been when I was an active musician at the time. All right, so how is this going to work? So these four presenters are going to talk about the various aspects of music, and um, I will introduce them each time. I'll warn the presenters this desk uh, can move a bit, so be careful with that. There's some water for you. The, each presenter has about 20 minutes to present. There's some time to ask questions. There will be no break in the middle, so we keep on going, like the, what shall we say, Matthias Passion, not as long as that, but, but about, um, about two hours we will keep on going. Uh, and then at the end, there will be some coffee for you to sort of uh, catch up again to get ready for uh, the uh, uh, dissertation uh, presentation of um, Valdi Hanser, right? So without further ado, um, I will uh, start to introduce the first presenter. Um, I don't think I introduced myself. My name is Rio Kopp. It's an irrelevant note um, and it doesn't matter much, but then at least you know who's talking to you. That's always interesting for the people who want to uh, complain later on. Um, <laughs> and anyway, so the first presenter is about this. Sometimes you hear a piece of music and you think like, what is this? Why do I have to listen to this? And it creates a form of... Um, if you will, disgust or some other form of unpleasant emotion. For those of you who are in the brain, your insula will be act acutely activated with um, all kinds of visceral responses to that. Other types of music have like a more like a, a approach behavior, like uh, you like it, it makes you engage in love or other forms of approach behaviors uh, that will not further be um, uh, gone into into detail now. So um, the first presenter of the four today um, comes from the United Kingdom. Originally he, came, he comes from the United States uh, in uh, somewhere in New York uh, State. Um, and now he's at um, Kent University in the United Kingdom. Um, he uh, presents some work uh, col in collaboration with his uh, graduate student uh, Heather Rolfi, and the first presentation will go into indeed the moral aspects of music, and he will uh, talk about this in more detail himself. So I'd like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Dr. Roger Giner Soloro, please. Thank you, Willem. Uh, so where's my presentation? Ah, here it is. Great. All right. Thank you all. Uh, hello, Tilburg. Uh, very glad to be here, very grateful to uh, Ad and uh, 
Billum for inviting me and uh, to present really some work that is uh, to, credited to my former PhD student who is now a lecturer at Cardiff Metropolitan University in Wales, Heather Rolf. And uh, these are basically four studies from her thesis that talk about moral disgust as a response to music. So we're going to start off, unfortunately, in a very negative sense and talk about the negative responses people have to music. But if you look at the history of music, um, you'll find that actually moral disgust is quite a common response to music that you don't like. So let me just go through a little bit, a very brief outline of the theory that we started this work with coming from social psychology research. Now, disgust and anger are often spoken of in the same sentence. I say, I'm disgusted and I'm angry. Um, but there is somewhat of a consensus. There's always a debate about this. But there's somewhat of a consensus that disgust and anger in moral situations respond to slightly different things. So the kind of when you feel one of these emotions towards something you think is immoral that someone has done, when you feel more disgust than anger, then the conventional wisdom from uh, about 20 years of research is that you're talking about violations of norms that are called various things, divinity or purity norms. We in our research have called them bodily norms. These are violations of norms in and of themselves about what kind of sex is okay to have, what kind of foods, especially meat, is all right to eat, and uh, other things that are considered sacred. Whereas when you feel more anger than disgust, the consensus goes that you're talking about things that actually hurt other people. So the prototypical more disgust than anger is, uh, let's say somebody is having, is, is committing a sex act that you think is gross or morally disgusting, immoral, such as consensual incest, but they're not actually hurting anyone. They're using contraception. There's no genetic consequences whatsoever. A brother and a sister, there's no exploitation. It's consensual, and yet people still feel this moral disgust because it's just something that's basically wrong, even though you can argue all you like. It's not actually hurting people. So <clears throat> this is the situation that we arrived at when Heather started out studying moral disgust towards music. And what we're going to show you is that in the realm of music, there's a little bit of a basis to challenge this uh, conventional wisdom. So let me explain with a short history of moral disgust felt towards music. Of course, I could make this a long history. We could talk about, for example, um, disgust towards uh, modern music, the riot that happened at the Rites of Spring uh, premiere from Stravinsky. Um, but just a few touchstones in sort of modern pop music. Uh, a lot of disgust was felt towards acts that were considered uh, overly sexual in the 1950s, like Elvis Presley um, <clears throat> was sometimes referred to as a disgusting musician banned from towns and so on. In the 1980s, some of you who are old enough may remember this, that there was, uh, there was a controversy about uh, heavy metal and rap music and the lyrics uh, that led to, if you can recognize this guy from the 80s, you're probably from my generation. This is Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister testifying in the American Congress. And then more recently, within living memory at least, uh, there, is, uh, there was a song called Blurred Lines. I don't know if it um, was a hit over here, but because of its video and the lyrics, it was criticized for sexism and some British universities went so far as to ban it from their uh, social event. You can see here that there's a little tweet um, Robin Thicke's a disgusting sleazebag, okay? And then you can see over here some people are protesting. There are no blurred lines, fuck Robin Thicke, okay? So the, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of disgust, a lot of controversy with music, mostly about the lyrical messages, I have to say, but also sometimes about the moves, as you can see with Elvis. Um, and you can, uh, for example, go on the internet, you can find people discussing what disgusting music is. And I, are these, maybe the, maybe the, uh, you can probably read this. Um, but so on Quora, somebody put the question, what is the most disgusting genre of music? And I think this is a good introduction to what we found in our, um, in our, uh, research. Because over here, um... Pop and rap is more disgusting than other music. They compare it to heavy metal, which this person is a defender of heavy metal. And these are, these are songs about serious 
topics. Um, rap is about sex, drugs, and murder, so that's why it's disgusting. Um, rap takes the cake in terms of corruption. It is unhealthy. The fan base is toxic. Uh, down here you have someone, white power music is disgusting. Racist music is disgusting. And I don't know if anyone from Sweden is in the house, but here we have dance band from Sweden. It's the worst and most meaningless music you ever heard. It makes you hate music. Okay, so here maybe you have moral disgust about the message within the music, be it uh, about crime and, and drugs or, or be it about uh, racism, but then you have a little bit of a, of a picture of aesthetic disgust with the person who is uh, offended by the dance band music. <clears throat> so we have two basic questions about these kinds of expressions of disgust. First of all, how much is it moral and how much is it aesthetic? Right? Now, moral, basically the difference is that morality has to do with how you think people should behave. Whereas aesthetics can be only personal, although some people might moralize aesthetics and say, you should, you should only like a certain kind of music, and if you like this other kind of music, there's something wrong with you. So it's a little bit uh, tricky, but I think moralization is taking the stance that this music is bad for everyone, and it's objectively wrong. Um, and we have to, dis to distinguish this from just having using the word disgust to express extreme dislike for the music style. So the question is to what extent, as we see here with these extreme uh, heavy metal musicians uh, from Norway, um, do you just think it's a ridiculous style and you don't like it, or do you think actually this is corrupting uh, people morally? And so if we do accept that this disgust expression is a moral expression, does disgust versus anger respond to the content of the music? Recall that the psychology research up until then uh, associates disgust with things like self-sexuality or self-pollution using drugs, but you might imagine from that research that then if you hear music that's about violence, it would make you angry because when you hear about real life violence, it makes people angry because of the harm to people. When you hear about real life sexual transgressions that don't harm people, Disgust is the prevalent response. However, there's another perspective, and we've in our lab have done some research on this, which is that when you're talking about um, expressions of uh, uh, you know, immorality rather than the actual acts of immorality, an overriding concern is to what extent does this corrupt the moral character of people? And from this point of view, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about sex, drugs, or violence, all of these things in a song rather than in real life would go to corrupt a person's moral character. You might say, well, this violent music doesn't actually harm anyone. Often the artists, including Tupac Shakur, who you see here in a violent stance, um, would say that this is just, you know, we're just presenting, we're just telling it how it is, we're just keeping it real. Um, but the answer to that is even if you're keeping it real, the fact that you normalize and you present this of violence uh, as something normal goes to corrupting character. It may not be an act of violence, but is facilitating and making it easier for people to go out and actually commit violence. So I'm gonna tell you very quickly about four studies that Heather <coughs> conducted under my supervision. And uh, studies one and two started with the emotion words. And half the people we asked, what makes you disgusted about music? Can you think of an example of music that makes you disgusted? And the other half we asked, can you think of an example of music that makes you angry? We wanted to see what kinds of music they came up with and what the differences between the reasons for being disgusted and angry were. But then uh, in studies three and four, we reversed in a sense the uh, direction of inquiry. We started with the traits of music that the first two studies identified. Let's see, if we give people these traits, do they respond with more disgust than anger uh, when these are traits associated with moral disgust, for example? So these uh, studies, in a sense, are symmetrical with each other, and within each pair, they're kind of replications of each other uh, with slightly different samples and, uh, and settings. Okay. So in study one, again, this was an online sample. Uh, we had about 90, uh, 90 people who were recruited from the online platform Amazon Mechanical Turk. And uh, Heather and a friend of hers coded these responses uh, according to what kind of reasons people came up with. 
So I'm going to show you, uh, show you first the reasons uh, in the disgust versus anger condition. You can see that um, if you go down the, the left line, I've, I've divided them into uh, concerns that are non-moral in blue, and then in red we have the concerns that are considered to be about moral issues. So aesthetics, uh, I just don't like the music, uh, was a fairly high uh, picked uh, reason, but you notice it was disgust and anger as prompts, it showed up pretty much the same for both of these. Um, intrusiveness, the music is annoying, was also about the same for disgust and anger. This music is associated with negative personal experiences I have. It brings bad memories, also, <coughs> also about equal and uh, personal emotion regulation was also kind of about equal, very low though. Uh, but so going uh, with the more popular moral reasons, um, there was a uh, tendency, a lot of people, when they were asked what disgusts you, they mentioned the objectionable moral content. And we have a subtype analysis on the next slide, but you'll see that for disgust, and statistically this was significantly higher at 59% than the 26% of people who uh, came up with morally objectionable music when asked what kind of music makes you angry, which is remarkable, I think. And also the fact that group harm, uh, another, another reason to uh, morally object to music also showed this significant difference, more so with disgust and anger. So um, already we see that disgust is distinctive in that it responds to moral content, but what about the specific kinds of things mentioned in the music? And we see here that actually... Um, both harm and purity content, that is both violence, which harms people, and swearing and drug use, which is more of a, which only harms uh, yourself, these were seen as uh, elicitors of disgust more so than anger. Then we had some very, not very often uh, mentioned moral concerns, uh, such as materialism and so forth, but the main ones were violence, bad language, and drug use, and these overwhelmingly were elicited for moral disgust as opposed to anger. Now study two, we, we switched to undergraduate students in the UK. We find very much the same results. Again, disgust more so than anger elicits morally objectionable content and group harm. Um, but now we see a little bit the reverse, <coughs> where anger more than disgust elicits negative personal experience. So people mostly are responding to music that makes them angry because it's associated with other people or bad experiences. And also many of these students say they listen to angry uh, music to re regulate their own emotions, to blow off steam uh, in a way. And again, when we look at the specific kind of moral concerns that show up more in disgust than anger, again, it's about sexuality now. Uh, this pops up with students, and you can think probably because this was done around 2016, 17, that the, the memory of the Blurred Lines song was still uh, in many of these students' minds as something that was sexist or you know, presented women in a de degrading way. Um, but again, violence and language more than discussed. There's no difference between violence and some of these uh, more purity concerns. Okay, so now moving to the third study. Here we start from the kind of reasons that we found in the first two studies, and we see if presenting these reasons can elicit more disgust than anger in the case of moral activities. So we have two moral uh, conditions. Uh, we have two moral questions. Um, activities you believe are morally wrong, and it's a sign that the listener is of a bad moral character. But then we have three non-moral reasons. We have it's aesthetically unpleasant. It's a bad example of a type of music. We found sometimes that people said, um, I'm disgusted by, uh, for example, heavy metal music that's gone pop or, that, or, or new metal that mixes in rap. And the people who are real heavy metal fan, fans, for example, seem to really be offended by these. So we brought this in as one question. Finally, again, that, uh, in the students, they had more anger primarily towards negative experience music that was associated with, uh, with, with the bad time. So we included that. And each student answered the same questions for each of these five prompts about these kinds of disliked music. So going to the, to the results, first of all, do moral, does moral, immoral content uh, 
provoke more disgust than anger? Yes, it does. You can see um, there's a, st a statistical test, but you can see also that the disgust bar is higher than the anger bar. And also we found more disgust than anger for aesthetic objections. Um, but we didn't find uh, a significant result for bad example, and negative experiences was almost the same, showing that disgust doesn't really prevail when people are talking about their own negative experiences. Um, and also, um, uh, recall that I said that one of, the, one of the hallmarks of moralization is that you're not content to tolerate the music, but you want to actually take action. You want to ban it from the radio. You want to destroy uh, the CDs and the, erase the files. Um, and the standard finding in research on people's actual behavior is that when people feel moral anger, they want to attack. When they feel moral disgust, they want to avoid or maybe talk about it with other people um, instead of actually confronting um, the people who are doing the immoral act. Um, and so we thought maybe this would be the same kind of finding that because the music isn't actually uh, causing anger but disgust, the people would want to avoid uh, music. And so we had these different kinds of behaviors, hostile approach and avoidance. We also asked about people's personal moral contagion concerns because one element of disgust is that it's contagious and you might be afraid of, seeing, of being seen as less moral if you're associated with that music. But we got a surprise when we looked at the action tendencies because even though these two moral reasons, moralization and moral character, had been shown to be higher in disgust than anger. We go back and see the moral and character were higher in disgust than anger, immoral content higher in disgust than anger. At the same time, if you look at the approach actions, the, the actions that were saying, I want to destroy the song, I want to ban it, I want to you know, aggress against the content, we find that moralization, moral character reasons have higher levels of wanting to erase the music and destroy the music uh, than the other kinds of uh, objection to the music. Whereas avoidance was pretty much the same uh, for all of these. And then also mor uh, moral, these moral reasons were associated with moral contagions. I'm concerned that if people could associate this music with me, uh, so I want to stay away from the music. So it seems that both approach and avoidance uh, actions are cued by this moral immorality of music that's associated with disgust. And um, in study four, we had uh, questions that were compressed some of the moral just into, into morally wrong. We didn't ask about moral character. Um, and we had added a social reason because people you don't like listen to it. Um, and once again, we found that disgust for um, immoral content was the prevailing emotion. And for personal experiences, um, we actually found that even though it wasn't significant, it was in the other direction for negative experience. There was slightly more anger than disgust expressed. Um, but once again, we found that more so than uh, the other reasons for not liking music, the immoral content led to more calls to ban the music, to destroy the music, which is interesting. You don't usually associate these with disgust, but um, to wrap it all up, how can we explain this paradox that music that you see as immoral shows both an emotional disgust response and a hostile response? And this, I think, is where we can think about the new way of understanding moral disgust as a response to bad character in people. When it comes to music, nobody is actually being harmed by the music, but there is a concern that music could corrupt the moral environment and in the long term lead to more harm by people losing their moral standards. And this is why both dis uh, uh, drugs, sexuality, and violence all create these concerns about music. And we shouldn't be surprised that people who are disgusted at music also want to destroy it. I'm showing you a picture of an example in the United States in the 1960s, this was right after John Lennon said, the Beatles are bigger than Jesus now. And this caused a lot of uh, controversies, you might imagine, among religious people. And this church organized a burning of Beatles records. Um, so they were morally disgusted. And I think uh, the take back for psychologists who study emotions, if you ask most psychologists in emotion, What's the action associated with disgust? They'll say, of course, avoidance, get away with something. But there's another action that's associated with disgust that I don't think is as well studied or appreciated, and that's to clean things up, 
right? And you can see these people who thought the Beatles were disgusting, corrupting, not necessarily hurting anyone, but they were being offensive to religion. Their response was to clean up the, the music scene and burn uh, the Beatles records. Um, so I think we need to study this kind of response more because it has, of course, important social implications. And with that, I will end and thank you very much. So stay here, please. So there's, uh, if you have any questions for um, um, uh, Dr. Gimmer, then or for Roger, I can say Roger, right? You can say Roger. Yeah, right? yeah. Then um, pl please do so. Uh, if not, I have uh, some suggestions. So any any questions from the audience? Just speak up because it's dark there, so we cannot see if you raise your hand. All right. While you think about a question, I have this theme for each present presenter, because we always give the applause in a bit of a, you know, um, common manner. So we're going to give each presenter a clap rhythm applause. So for Roger, I have this one. So you clap with me, okay? There we go. This. There we go. Thank you. So think, think about another one for, for the next lecture. So thank you very much. No more questions? Oh, oh go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, we have to give you a microphone, otherwise people get annoyed with me. Hi, Roger. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the presentation. It was really cool. Um, I'm just wondering, um, like, is there any, any follow-up research planned? Um, and I'm also wondering, does like disgust relate to any particular people, like personality? Or... Yeah. Oh, I, I'm and glad did you, you find asked. that with the music as well? I'm, I'm working with another PhD student right now. It's not necessarily about music, but it's about personality and what kind of personality traits create this moral disgust at a bad character. And we find actually that in psychology, there's uh, a set of personality traits called the dark triad, which are narcissism, uh, sadism and Machiavellianism, or using other people as means to an end. And we find that when you present these, even if they're not harming anyone, when somebody expresses narcissism, they're viewed as having a bad moral character, and they're seen with more disgust than anger. But if you add the, the fact that the narcissism actually is harming somebody, then you get the anger going up as well. So that's maybe an answer to the question of what kind of people. And I think sometimes in the music studies as well, we would get these negative responses to artists who you feel are maybe, they're setting a bad example, they're narcissistic. Uh, so I think we even saw a little bit of that. Some, sometimes people would object to individual musical artists and say they're so full of themselves or you know, they, they don't have a good lifestyle. Um, I think those are, those are examples of, uh, of bad moral character, and so the new understanding now is that moral disgust is a response to other people's bad character, regardless of whether it harms people or not. Oh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I have a question. There's this older work by Dolph Silman about um, uh, personal ads and music preference, and he says, oh, I'm Jenny, by the way, and I like heavy metal. And the boys didn't like Jenny because she liked heavy metal, but if she liked classical music, she was more popular. And with the boys, it was the other way around. <laughs> so it was 30 years ago. And, mm. and, and I don't know, there hasn't been that much replication in that, and I'm wary about the methodology and everything. But huh. this is, do you think it's dangerous to reveal a music preference in a personal ad? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think, how did they interpret that? Was that about gender uh, roles? Because, um, yeah, heavy metal is a more masculine kind of music, and classical is maybe seen as more feminine, perhaps, uh, would be my first guess as to why that's happening. But yeah, it can be, it can be dangerous, it can be controversial, and people, uh, I think we see people moralize the genres of music as well. And some genres are, are controversial, but even if you are normal, that's also controversial. Some people don't like normal music. If you like uh, pop music, uh, you know, if you like, if you like, I don't know, Michael Buble or, 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 or whatever, some people might say, oh, that's so normy. That's so, you know, just, uh, I, come on, you have to be extreme. And I think the safest thing to be is actually eclectic. 
I like all kinds of music. That seems to be maybe the, the, the top of the aesthetic pyramid. Uh, but of course, if you say, oh, that, that includes country music, then people say, what? You like country music? So it's a little bit dangerous. You have to be eclectic in the right way. Uh, I don't know. That's just my impression of the topic. Are there other questions? Oh, we have a question over there. I can hear. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. coughs> um, the question is whether you also look at the uh, the impact of the group or the the, the media in, in this respect. Uh, so uh, mm. people might have their individual um, disgust or anger, but it can also be stimulated, created if the group <coughs> or society reacts. We have a very interesting case right now. We have a band, Gold Band, and they were awarded a prize. Uh, recently, but also recently, the singer sniffed cocaine on stage. And now we don't know what to think about it. Some people react quite, uh, some people in the media, we, we, they react quite strongly. But it might also influence what individual people think, uh, because they might not have made up their mind yet. So <coughs> is there also research that also looks at the societal broader yeah. context? Well, it's not part of my research, but it is, I mean, I, there are uh, people who study media effects, and I think that's what you're referring to. Uh, we just study individuals. We don't care where their attitudes come from in our psychology studies, because psychology is about the individual mind. But maybe if you look in sociology, there is a literature on moral panics. And I think some of the examples I presented with Elvis Presley, with blurred lines, I mean, panic is a judgmental word, right? It, it, so some people like, say, moral anxiety. Mu music definitely provokes these kinds of um, I, think, I think what's going on is that people are trying to regulate the culture. I think they want to say, is this a good environment to raise children in? Is, a, is this a good environment, uh, a cultural environment in general? And so when some kinds of subcultures or music and you know, the, first, uh, the first studies of moral panic were in response to youth subcultures in England, the Teddy Boys in the 1950s, the Mods and the Rockers in the 1960s that were uh, involved with uh, drugs, sex, violence, you name it. Um, and the, the concern there was that the youth are growing up like this and they're going to grow up to be bad adults, when actually most of them grew up to be just boring adults like the rest of us. So, uh, you know, that, in, in a way there was this judgment of moral panic, but yeah, definitely things like somebody uh, publicly using, uh, you know, hard drugs on, on stage creates this, um, I, think, I think some people say, well, he can do what he wants, but other people say, what kind of example is this setting? What kind of a moral environment are we looking at? And I think that that's kind of the takeaway message of my music. But I don't study media in, in particular, but I think that is a good uh, application. Because obviously, we hear about music from the media. We don't have to experience this personally. And then when people see something on, on the media, they can come together. There's more communication than ever. There's the internet. There are user groups. People sort of create. Um, on Twitter in particular, you can create these outrage mobs in an instant and uh, focus on someone for 48 hours as the, as the focus of outrage. And so I think, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely it would be good to look at the media role in this. Thanks. Okay. Are you done? Yeah, we have to. We have to. This we must move. move. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, this is... Um, if you think about the morality of music, you got to think about, for example, the lyrics of some uh, songs, for example, Bodak Yellow, that starts with like, little bitch, you can fuck with me, and it goes downhill from there, right? Or for the Dutch people here in the audience, the song Testosterone, if you listen, have never listened to it, it's horizon expanding. Um, <laughs> what it does, and I think this is by partly why you didn't talk about this, but the brain structures associated with disgust are very closely uh, connected with the brain structures um, uh, connected with the sexual response. But now we're going to go to a different basic emotion. So we had anger and disgust, right? Those are two basic emotions. Another important one is sadness. And the next speaker, uh, Dr. Annemiek van den Tol, Name sounds suspiciously Dutch, but she is located in the United Kingdom as well. So the UK representation is excellent today here. She is from uh, Lincoln University. She's there a lecturer in psychology. And she's going to talk to 
about us about the strange ideas like why do people listen to sad music? Annemiek, the floor is yours. So, hi everyone, I'm Annemieke van den Tol. Um, thank you, Art, for uh, inviting me here. So, yesterday I, I practiced this presentation. I went a little bit over time, so I need my, my, my phone here. <laughs> um, so, give me a sign if I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much. Um, so, yeah, Annemieke van den Tol is my name. I'm a senior lecturer in psychology at the University of Lincoln. I'm going to talk about sad music and uh, the paradox of uh, sad music making people happier sometimes. And I'm also going to discuss, like, why people like to listen to uh, sad music and give you a few more other facts about sad music. So that's my presentation. Um, so, uh, first question that I usually get when I say that I study sad music is what is sad music? So I put that here uh, on a slide. They um, did a lot of research um, in uh, which musicians were, were asked to uh, play some music that sounded sad and then the uh, um, people like the audience was was asked or the participants were asked like what emotion is this musician trying to portray and uh, people do very well in recognizing uh, what emotions musicians try to portray in their music um, they also looked at what musical traits you typically find in sad music and music that is perceived to uh, supposed to sound sad so put them on the slide as well you might not know what all of them mean but um, if you're not a musician uh, usually it has minor chords usually the instruments that make the music are acoustic the tempos are slower um, sound levels are lower um, there's a lower pitch and the pitch range is more uh, narrow, so it's less, less of a, a, a vivid melody. The timbres are dull and dark. Um, and uh, then um, I learned as well that recent music, however, has a, a, a few more major chords um, in, so the, 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 the more recent sad music has more major chords than it traditionally had and uh, is a little bit more complex. So uh, that's great to learn um, that, that, that there's more uh, depth in the, the recent sad music. Um, so some percentages. So uh, they did studies trying to find out how many people like sad music and uh, the majority of people apparently don't like it. Only 40% of people like to listen to uh, sad music. And uh, there's another statistic that only 25% of people uh, like to feel sad as a result of listening to sad music. So it's not a very common phenomena. Um, so a um, little bit about me. I'm actually Dutch. I studied in Tilburg. Um, the professor Art Vingerhoots was my uh, undergraduate uh, and master thesis uh, supervisor and got me interested in um, music and emotion. Um, we did a, a, two projects on music and emotion. And what I found out was that there isn't really a lot of literature. There was like many years ago on, uh, on music and emotion. Uh, so when once I graduated, or probably even before uh, I graduated, um, I contacted a, a professor in, uh, in Ireland who was also a, a music therapist. He was quite famous and I talked with her, uh, would you like to do a, 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 P, a PhD with me? Would you like to do more research with me, finding out more about sad music? Why do people listen to it if it makes them sad? And she got very enthusiastic, let me do a PhD with her. Like one of the first things that she told me is like, yeah, it, 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 it makes sense uh, uh, that people like to listen to sad music when they're 
feeling sad. When I work with depressed patients, uh, it doesn't make, make, make sense to uh, expose them to, to or to listen happy music with them to make them happier. I always start off listening to, to some more sad sounding music to connect with them first before we move on to that. And she also sh showed me a, a, a couple of papers. Um, we had a lot of discussion. Uh, I found out that uh, patients who were recently diagnosed with cancer, um, like uh, in a paper, that, that they like listening to uh, sad music to, to grieve, to do something with their uh, emotions of sadness because they didn't want to bur burden their, their en en environment with, with their sadness. They wanted to uh, appear strong, but then they could turn to the music and, 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 and like do something with their emotions uh, there. Uh, there were also papers about adolescents listening to sad music to cope with their problems, but there wasn't really a, a, a good paper yet on um, why people in general, like broadly, theoretically, like to listen to sad music when feeling sad. Uh, so yeah, we took that up on ourselves. Um, we didn't define sad music for the participants, just whatever the participants found, uh, yeah, sad music themselves. Um, we, uh, 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 yeah, we started this off by uh, writing an open-ended questionnaire um, and um, sending out emails, putting on, on uh, 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 messages on Facebook, and, and I don't think we had Twitter yet, but like asking anyone who actually likes to listen to sad music when feeling sad to participate in our survey we said basically five questions. Why did you like to listen to sad music? Did it actually, uh, like, for, like yeah, for what psychological reason did you like to listen to sad music? Did it actually work? Like what you were trying to achieve? Like why this specific sad music? Were you in a, uh, yeah, give, give us some information on, on, on the situ situation that you were in. And is there anything else that you think we missed that you, uh, uh, about the topic of listening to sad music when feeling sad that you think is important for us to know. So um, we ended up with 65 uh, participants doing this survey before we uh, started looking into what they said. Um, so here is a, a summary of the reasons, uh, uh, of the different reasons that we found them reflecting on uh, uh, in, 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 the, uh, yeah, in their responses. So we uh, said there's, like based on what, what, what all these participants said, uh, yeah, the following psychological reasons for uh, listening to sad music have been mentioned by our uh, participants. The, yeah, the first one is uh, sadness and re-experiencing effect, that's what we called it, and uh, was one of the most, most important reasons, most commonly mentioned. It, um, people liked to listen to sad music because they wanted to be in touch with the sadness they already had. Uh, they wanted to express it, get, get, get over it, uh, intensify it, but they, they wanted to do something with that sad emotion while they were listening to the music and they found the music to be very effective for that. Um, then uh, the second one, for the second one, I need to reflect on the situations they uh, uh, reported as well. So when people feel sad, they've often, uh, yeah, sadness can often be caused by uh, a feeling of loss. Uh, so uh, uh, commonly participants said um, they listen to sad music after a, a breakup. Uh, there were some examples of, of loss as well, um, like a loss of a loved, loved one, and there was some uh, yeah, loss of a situation like nostalgia, like back in the days I used to hang out with these people, but I don't see them that often anymore. So people wanted to um, bring that whatever they had lost back a little bit and retrieve memories of, of loved ones or people that they felt close to with music that somehow represented them. Uh, so that we call mem memories and social. Um, and then surprisingly, 
Um, a lot of people actually said I wanted to feel better. So I listened to sad music when feeling sad because I wanted to feel, um, to feel better. And uh, that's quite an interesting one. So we looked, well, at least it inspired me. I, it got me really interested. So I looked really close at the, at the uh, examples of the, what people gave there. Um, and a lot of the uh, uh, people who wanted to feel better either described that something needed to happen when they were listening to the music. So they, they needed to come to some realization, um, like reorganize their thoughts, like many people uh, uh, reflected on ups and downs being um, like common in, in people's lives and like listening to this music with this singer going through the same thing kind of like reassured them and made them feel better. Um, uh, others like just said like I just just really like this music. It's distracting me and although it's sad it just keeps things off my uh, off my mind. Um, yeah so that's the other two uh, common uh, themes that ha happened in our uh, uh, in our data, like rephrasing and organizing your thought or simply wanting to be distracted. Um, some people also mentioned that, that they were more able to accept any sadness or the situation if, if they listened to the music or after they had listened to it. And uh, uh, the last, maybe not as commonly exactly described as a friend, but there seemed some friend-like characteristics um, hidden in the music and uh, here is one of my uh, favorite quotes by a 33 year old female um, like she, 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 yes she was really loving listening to music so I'll read it out I felt befriended by the music by this I mean that if you were to pretend the music or the lyrics was a real person with his lyrics of understanding friendship comfort and confidence then surely the song would be your best friend, your soulmate. Music is personified, or music personified is your soulmate, your trusted secret friend who can emphasize with you. And 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 this this lady, um, like she wrote a lot in her in her response. She was at that moment. Uh, um, she had a fiance, and he, he lived on the, the like somewhere else on the planet. Uh, they were far away from each other. She said that she she missed him terribly. Um, she would make CDs with with songs for him uh, of, of of that represented uh, yeah her her feelings for him, and that she could connect with, so that he could listen to them then again and like understand her her, her feelings. Uh, more. Um, so uh, that's why she listened to uh, some sad music when feeling sad. So there was a lot in this response. Um, so yeah, who are like ma making these CDs that she had a, a con connection with. That brings me, me to uh, the next topic. And like, like kind of like what surprised me at that moment, uh, uh, being a, a young academic in music psychology, I thought like a lot of people um, would select music because they simply find it beautiful. Like, why listen to any music? Like, like why why else would you listen to music? Or what, what other music would you listen to? Like, I thought like high aesthetic value would be the most important reason for listening to the music. Yet my participants, they kept on going on. So they did mention, like I listened to the music because it was beautiful, but my participants kept on going on about identifying with the content of the lyrics or the mood of the, uh, of the music. Uh, and there was also a lot of like, yeah, reflection on, on the memories they had attached to the, to the music. Um, and then a few participants said, like, yeah, if I listen to that music, that gives me like a feeling of hope. So it gives me some direction of what I want to do or should do next. Um, so, so that's something else we, we found out about uh, sad music. It's a lot about connecting with the music. Um, yeah, so once I had finished that, that project, like one, one question still remained 
for for me and my supervisor like how is it possible so many people feel 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 better like if you listen to sad music aren't you supposed to 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 feel sadder um so we looked at our data we looked at psychology uh, uh literature in general um reflected on 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 uh like how people regulate their emotions and uh we theorized um yeah the sad music might help uh people to feel distracted from their own sadness like if you if you ever read my paper that, that there's like um there was also like one part participant who went through something really bad like a family member died or maybe even two and she said it was so so uh, i was so so sad i could not bear any any happy music so it needed to be sad music but i needed to be distracted and that made me feel better and less worse so that's the distraction um another thing that we thought was uh yeah this this reflection on your thoughts this cognitive reappraisal as we psychologists call it and um like in mindfulness they call it common humanity just the like the realization that life isn't just all like happiness but there's ups and downs this is normal um like that realization can like be comforting um so that was another uh, reason why we felt people might feel better and then the other one quite straightforward like they just really find this music beautiful and they like it very much uh, and uh, that makes them happy um so i'll ask me not to bore you guys with too many statistics so i will be uh short here uh, so basically what what i wanted to know is uh it's like how do all these things uh, correlate to each other um so we did a follow up study uh for which i wrote a questionnaire with items that reflected all these different reasons for listening to the music and all the different reasons for selecting the music um and then i run them through a statistical uh, a couple of statistical analysis just to find out like what relates most to feeling better so basically uh, in lay non psychology academic language those people who feel happier like um, who, who score these items on feeling happier um, as a reason for listening to to music like are they also the same people that say they often re they listen for rephrasing their thought or to be distracted mm -hmm. And are they also the same people um, who, who said that um, listening or they select the music because it was so beautiful? Um, and uh, yeah, ba basically, um, I, I'm not going to bore you too much with the statistics. But yeah, basically, we found that what we thought was uh, uh, verified in the data. So people feel happy or happier and um if they want to feel happier they they select the music to to reflect on their thoughts to distract them from their thoughts and uh, they select music that they find more beautiful rather than that they focus on uh on uh, uh, other elements uh, um so yeah what else uh, b besides my own research what else does other uh, research say so there's neurological evidence nowadays that uh beautiful music even when it is uh, sad and it's supposed to make us feel sad uh, can be uh, very rewarding and can make people feel uh, happier so the areas for like reward in our brain like are basically active when um when we hear beautiful sad music so there's a there's quite a few studies now that show that um there is like um theorizing about sad emotions um being like like when you listen to the music and you feel sad uh that's a different type of sadness than like more everyday life sadness so normally in everyday life like when you feel sad so something has happened like a loss um and in 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 this yeah if you feel sad as a result of listening to to sad music then the sadness doesn't have to be 
uh, relevant or threatening or require you to, to, to do any action. You can just feel, feel sad. There's no uh, 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 personal relevance. Uh, and that brings me to um, empathy. People who are uh, more empath empathetic, like who, who, who enjoy having uh, more empathy, um, who, who, yeah, who, who, who care more about um, others when they, when they have trouble, they are also more likely to, to uh, enjoy sad music. So there's a correlation with empathy and sad music. Um, similarly, like those people who are open to experience, it's a psychology term, but it basically means that, that they are just mm -hmm. like a bit more, more emotionally adventurous. They like more ups and, and, and downs. Um, they also like more, uh, yes, yeah, sad music, more, get more enjoyment out of it. And those who are uh, more likely to, uh, to get lost in the moments. Um, and then... Um, also, uh, one more thing um, that might or might not be interesting to you, uh, but that, but but I, uh, uh, yeah. But we found out that if you hear music commonly in in a, in a in a situation that is generally positive, like when you are around your friends or in the pub, like if it's like somehow coupled to something else that is positive, uh, then you start liking it more because it drops off on on, on each other. Um, so uh, positive associations are like rubbing off on, on the sad music. So if you commonly go to a pub where they like sad music, you will end up liking sad music yourself more. Yeah. Don't know how much time I have. I don't know. Oh, dear. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, sad music listening. Um, is, however, also like liking sad music is, is as I already, as you might have already picked up, um, like also related to, to being sad at that moment. It's therefore also related to having higher depression and higher uh, rumination. Um, so one thing uh, that you might might wonder, like, is it really that that, that, that good to, to like uh, sad music? And, and, and I always Im Im imagine like, actually have, have a friend currently that has a, has a grandson that is, is listening to a lot of sad music and really worried about it. And uh, she wanted to talk with me about this. Um, um, and um, like what, what, what I had to explain to her is, um, yeah, it's, it's sad music listening can indeed indicate that there is a mental health issue, but it is a as I see it, it's a co 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 correlation, it's an association. It's not the sad music that uh, probably is causing the, the mental health issues. The mental health issues make him attracted to, to the, uh, the sad music and he might actually get something out of it. You might also not. Um, uh, it, it doesn't work for every, everyone. Yet, uh, 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 neuroscientists have, have, have evidence now that listening to music in general can uh, repair some of the diminished experience of pleasure associated with various uh, mood disorders. Uh, and another thing I want to express uh, or to reflect on, um, there are studies showing that uh, uh, if you ask people to write about their trauma, uh, a couple of times, um, they will um, have better health outcomes at the end of the study. Um, there's also like studies showing um, that, bef like like in, in in a mental hospital, for example, before people recover, they often start opening up a lot more. Like like doing something with your emotions is 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 healthier. Suppression is the worst. Um, and um, yes, yeah, sad music can provide you with uh, solace and acceptance of uh, uh, negative situations. Um, and acceptance can reduce physiological symptoms of anxiety and stress. Um, the take home message. So listening to music can be pleasurable and can be a healthy way to cope, yet it may not be for everyone. 
Um, yeah, it's just a case, case, case to case basis. Uh, um, if like, if it's yourself, try it. And if you aren't enjoying it, then just leave it. Um, if it has a negative effect on you, then don't do it. If it works for you, um, yeah, <laughs> that's basically it. Uh, it. Yeah, so it might or might not be for you. Um, so, and a, a quick thank you. So that's the lady that was my PhD supervisor, a music therapist. Um, um, my husband helped me with the last paper, uh, co-authored it. Uh, I've had a lot of, uh, well, endless discussion with Valdi about music in the last couple of years. And uh, also with, yeah, Professor Fingerhoots, like who started all this uh, <laughs> madness off and, and helped me gather some uh, data. Yeah, that's basically it. All right, let's get here for Anamik with um, a special applause, the blues rhythm. Let's do it. Okay, thank you very much. This is great. So, well, if you talk about sad music, right, um, let's first um, at least get some questions for the speaker. Are there any questions? And again, just start talking, then we'll uh, get the microphone to you. Many, many, many thanks. Uh, this is very, uh, very thought-provoking. And uh, just a comment. I think what the famous, most s s considered the most saddest piece in music history is uh, the Raindrop Prelude by Chopin. And it's actually in C-sharp major. <laughs> so, so, but it's considered one of the saddest pieces. I, I think it's a more a personal thing. I don't think there is per se sad music. It's a it's a personal experience. So it's all happening in our brains, what we consider as sad. Uh, but, at, but it's also a topic in, in music history, and I think it's an important one. And, and also, the, I, I was only reflecting on you saying that recently discovered that more recent sad music was major, but it's actually some old music is quite sad, too. <laughs> well, let, let me respond to this, because it's actually, if you th think this more on the music theory part, like if you s play, play, for example, C sharp chord, make it simple, C chord, right? C, E, G. There's a, a normal major chord, makes you happy. If you change the bass from a C to an A, that happy chord becomes a minor chord, uh, a minor seven chord, but details. And so... The context of a, co a constellation of three notes makes it minor or major, but if it makes you feel happy or sad, it has to do with the underlying bass, right? So that's part of the part of the issue involved. And that's the cool I, thing. I, I do yeah? actually yeah. have it as well. Cool. So Go ahead. Like, like, I, I think it's it's not just it's it's like a combination of these traits that make it sound sad. So it doesn't have to have all the traits, like. That's ba basically it. So probably it was slower, softer, or yeah, l like that's probably what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Valdi, you had something also with the funeral tunes, right? With major and minor. Yeah. He is on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. First of all, that was a nice presentation. Um, but my, uh, I have a like a small series of questions which are linked to each other. So, like first question was related to the uh, research you conducted. Uh, my question was that the research which in which you ask people, uh, like the volunteer, the students, that what were their feelings to in respect to the sad music. My question is, did you make them listen like, uh, or was the research included only one music, one particular type of music, and uh, did all the people present there were they sad or were they happy or were they neutral because a person's state of mind also determined what they are part feeling particularly uh, related to a particular music yeah so yeah thank you for that question so it's no normally I, I present this as a two-hour lecture so i had to throw out some details uh so uh maybe some confusion happened there um so 
I asked people in an open-ended questionnaire um, why they sometimes want to listen to sad music when feeling sad. I did not define what sad music was. So it was whatever they themselves like considered sad music. Yeah, so it was an open-ended questionnaire. They just saw a couple of questions and, and could write down. Um, and it was, um, so it was a writing exercise. And I, I asked them to specifically focus on listening to sad music when they are feeling sad and reflect on, like tell us what their reasons were for doing so. And if they got anything out of it, like something psychological. So I hope that answers your question. So it wasn't in a lab or anything like that. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have to really move on because there are so many interesting things to talk about today. For example, thank you. Um, thank you, Annemiek. <laughs> so if you have, for example, the blues, go, which goes to minor and major chords, which is very interesting. Thank you for supporting for forwarding the slides. Uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge the people from Studium Generale who set up this uh, conference together with uh, Alt Fingerhoods. So this is uh, very excellent. Um, so changing between major and minor also gives you sort of like a power to handle uh, adversities. So if you look at blues songs or listen to Nina Simone, all these tunes, um, very powerful. To get a broader context on music, we're now going to have a presentation uh, from Germany, uh, from um, and Dr. Uh, Gunther Kreutz. Um, I'll not. Ma I'll just massacre the English language and keep the German language uh, undisturbed for this evening, uh, except for thanking you very much uh, for your time to come here. And we're very curious to hear if you maybe also cover, in addition to anxiety, the more positive emotions in your lecture. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for our coming and for the invite. I'd excellent host, many, many thanks. Um, I entitled my talk, uh, Some answer, Answered Questions. I mean, uh, as researchers, we, want, we don't want to get jobless. We want more research to be done. So um, there were always questions that remain unanswered. And um, also, I see a lot of young people here, which is very exciting. So uh, my stance is uh, not can we afford music psychology research. Uh, it's more a question like, can we afford to ignore music psychology research? Because I think it, more and more people realize it does something contribute to our society, to our understanding, to culture. And culture is now in a very difficult situation in this multiple crisis. And we think we can, uh, politicians think we can sacrifice it. And I don't think we sh it's a good idea to sacrifice culture. So I would, would like to take you back a little bit into the history of music and emotion, and there isn't much until the year around 2000, when until then it was more or less marginalized. The, the seminal book on music psychology until the 2000 was Leonard Meyer's Music and Meaning and Emotion from 1956. And he was a, a music theorist, and his theory was emotion was elicited when something unexpected happened in the music. And then I investigated general theories of emotion at that time, in the 50s. It was exactly that, that emotion theorists thought emotion arose from some sort of surprise, something unexpected, something unusual, disrupting the pattern. And this picture began to change as the neuroscience approach to and, and other and various approaches to um, psychology of, of emotion emerged. There was very influential work by uh, Joseph Ledoux doing uh, both animal models, the, studying the fear system, and uh, the Damasios who studied personality and emotion doing the Phineas Gage uh, work, uh, the case work. It's very exciting read, so I, I invite you to go back to that literature because it's where it all started from the neuroscience of emotion that we have today. And there was one piece of work where John Sabota disputed with Leonard Meyer by saying, because it was a common, more was a common wisdom or almost a dogma that physiological responses to music were random. So you cannot predict from a musical structure the emotional response. And, and uh, John Sabota said, oh, I'm going to challenge that. And he sent out 
uh, letters to musicians and say, well, give me scores uh, of places where you have particular feelings in the moment of a, of a piece. So he asked musicians because they could read scores and they could tell about their physical response. And if you have a shiver or if you have tears, it's, you cannot be, go wrong. There are the tears running and it's, you cannot be mistaken about that emotional response, about this physiological response. So he broke with this narrative that it was all random and all unrelated. And what, what he found indeed was there were some um, a statistically um, um, supported relationships between musical structures. Uh, don't bother about the, the terms, they are unimportant. But they could, he could associate that with specific responses like tears and shivers. And, and, and also uh, cardiovascular responses. So he was, he was the first evidence, I think, that uh, was documented in the empirical literature that there was a relationship. I mean, the debate is much older. The philosophic, philosophical debate goes back to the late 19th centuries with debates between Hans Lick and, and Hausegger. And so there was a long time of speculation, but now people started to get into, onto rational uh, grounds. And, and this is one of the, of the pieces that, um, that appears in so, uh, John Sabota's paper. And I've, um, for the matter of time, I, I save you from, from playing it. It's uh, the second movement, uh, the third movement of Rachmaninoff's um, symphony. So take the time, listen to it. It's really an attack on your tear glands, <laughs> or some of you. It's just, uh, now you're probably conditioned to Hollywood movies, whenever there is a dramatic romantic scene or a separation, you, you feel this kind of music it comes to you. And, and so it's exploited. So film music is very instructive also about uh, emotional uh, responses to music. So let's discuss some of the seminal work. <clears throat> Patrick Yuslin and John Salboda threshed out this volume, Music and Emotion, and they pi were pioneering the field with um, taking on board various perspectives from biology, philosophy, music theory. And it's really a very inspiring source still today to uh, get some, some foot on the ground where this is all coming from. And these scholars are still active and they have founded large scale facilities like the Brahms in Montreal and, and other centers. And there's the Music in the Brain Center in, in Denmark, in Aarhus. And now in Finland, there is a new center of excellence between Helsinki and Vescule, a multi-million uh, funded research conglomerate. And sure enough, emotion is in the very heart of, this, of these uh, large-scale projects. So that it, it has really taken off since then. And this is really bad news for the pharmaceutical industry because music gets there where they want to get to with their drugs. So if you think sex is overrated, drugs are overrated, boring, good food, the, the healthier it is, the less tasty it is, try music. <laughs> you can try music to get to the midbrain and get a sense of reward and getting high feelings of pleasure and goosebumps because it's almost uh, certain that you can get something out of it. Unfortunately, um, there is no, uh, not like a, uh, specific music that that I can give you a list, this will trigger the emotion. No. In this study by Blood and Satore, what triggered uh, goosebumps in one person was a control for another person. <laughs> so, so the second person didn't feel anything. So it was a perfect control to, to in with this kind of this distraction or the um, uh, this kind of an analysis where you distract a response from one person from another to the same physical stimulus so you can tease out where things are happening. On the left side, do you see where, where activity is rising in the ventral striatum and in uh, some areas of the, um, of the midbrain, uh, orbital for including the orbital frontal cortex. And in the right side, you see down regulation, including parts of the amygdala, so your, your fear and uh, a ten, high attention system is downregulated, so you're on a cloud of, of happiness and, and timelessness when you enjoy goosebumps. Um, it's, the goosebumps are very rare, and I was always wondering why would 
we just strive for something, things that are so rare. And but if you even if you don't have goosebumps and you still feel the pleasure, you still have a very very similar response. So the goosebumps are just the peaks or the skin orgasms, well, as, as Punkzap has termed them, um, in response to music. But below that, even if you don't have such strong overt emotional responses or physiological responses, the midbrain is still very sensitive uh, to that. And sadly, um, when, when you have strokes in the, in the wrong part of the brain, your feeling for music is gone. This is a very rare case, but it did happen in a, a British um, radio moderator, and he used to have strong emotional feelings in response to music, but after that stroke, he was still processing music as normal. His auditory cortex was working, and his associated areas of auditory areas mm -hmm. were all working fine, but he didn't feel anything. And now we know why he didn't feel anything, because there is also a link between cortical areas and the midbrain that communicate and relay the experience and bring it to your, your consciousness. <coughs> so if that's, that's, that can happen and it really, um, it's, it's, it took a toll on the quality of life of, of that man. <coughs> so when we listen to music, that's fine. And I would never say music listening is passive. You're, if you're listening to an active mind, you read music is listening is passive all the time in many, many journals. I think it's wrong. Music listening is a very active, but it's a receptive process. But, and sometimes we feel inclined to sing along. So if you go to a rock concert, I don't think that people go there in thousands just to stand there and experience the rock music. I don't think that will happen. They will be cheering, they will be moving, they will be singing along and having a good time. So it's, it's a small, relatively small step extending from the receptive theory to the overt and engaging and singing. Now, in Germany, we do have called so-called Rudelsing. It's a karaoke, karaoke for everyone in pubs, <coughs> but people show up with a, with a screen like this and they, instead of talking, they start singing and everybody sings along. And the tickets sell out instantly. And there are really some virtuosos who can uh, lead a crowd of, of self-declared non-singers and self-declared non-musicians and anti-musics and make them sing um, and, and change their life with that. So it's, choral singing has, been, has also been, the research has shown that it's, there's something in it. And a seminal paper published by Clift and Hancocks in 2001, Stephen Clift is a health educator and Granville Hancocks is a choir master. And they were singing together in, in Christchurch Canter Canterbury University Choir. And they asked themselves, why are we doing this? What do we get out of this? So they started asking around, why do you sing here? Do you think it has any benefits for you? And they found out to their, a bit to their surprise, that the people were very convinced that it was good for them. And they, they believed that it enhances their moods, relaxes them, reduces stress, and even they thought it improves their lung functions and their immune functions. How can you, as a singer, assume that singing improves your immune functions? I mean, you cannot self-analyze your, your blood or saliva or what output of, of, uh, of proteins. But I thought, well, why not do it <laughs> and, and just check that? And sure enough, um, we found that uh, in a church choir in, in Frankfurt that um, when we compared singing and on one occasion and listening to choral music on another occasion with the same group of people uh, set a, a week apart, um, we learned if people want to sing don't stop them, otherwise negative emo emotions go up <laughs> because they want to sing and they couldn't sing, so their negative uh, feelings uh, were rising. Um, but we also noticed that the proteins that are produced in the upper respiratory pathways that are the first line of defense against viral def infections and bacterial infections, so-called immunoglobulin A, it went up in the singing condition, but not in the listening condition. And cortisol went down 
And we assume that somebody might fall asleep <laughs> in, in the listening condition. Well, who knows? There are other studies who also show that uh, there's a cortisol reduction in rehearsal, but it goes up in a concert situation, so it's a differentiated view. It's not necessarily bad. I mean, cortisol is considered a stress hormone, but it's also impossible to live without cortisol. It's, it's a vital hormone that we, we have high levels in the morning and slow levels in the evening, and it's, it's a very vital hormone for us. So it's, it's a, a bit of a reduction to say it's, it's a stress hormone. Of course, it has to do with, with stress a lot. And in a more recent study, I had a chance also to get a lab to analyze oxytocin. It's, it's a more tricky and difficult and more controversial and what do we measure actually in this really, really tiny dosages of oxytocin? But nevertheless, in this study, uh, it, it turned out that oxytocin went up in a, in a singing condition. But this time, I asked the, the, the same people not to just to listen, but to chat because they use their mouth. They have something positive in their minds. So they have lots of the singing experience, except they do not sing. And in the chatting, also, the positive mood went up negative mood state level and there was no response uh, on the physiological side. Also biomarkers didn't respond to that. So, and now we've turned uh, from listeners to singers and now uh, something completely different, music instruments. Uh, what do, does a music instrument do for us? Because let's not forget that there are even more instrumentalists than, than singers, in, uh, actually. Um, and um, I looked a little bit into this, this research, and I find it fascinating that we had this topic of befriendedness and social surrogates. And um, I'm sure for many people who also have their blues in their lives, uh, a musical instrument is something to lean to, and to not only to cheer us up, but to live through emotions and also to, um, to rebuild and restore um, their, their relationship to, to the world, to the life, to their own motivations, or whatever. So there is some research about it, and it's not a lot, uh, but I think uh, in the pandemic has taught us that musical instruments can be important resources when there is, uh, people are separated. And it's even um, advantageous over singing because singing in groups doesn't work very well uh, online. There have been various attempts but uh, many choirs have uh, unfortunately been closed and we're not sure whether they will revive again. So the, the pandemic has taken a huge toll. And musical instruments, but they stay with the person and they are, they are very resistant to any, any pandemic. You can practice, we can play, and we can relate to that and, and do something musical meaningful. So, uh, more academic questions, what is the role of musical emotions for well-being? I mean, emotions, uh, music and emotions just fine, but I always thought, well, emotion for its own sake, just to have it, to live through it and wait for it to happen again. I think we want more. We want to have a balance in our lives. We want to have a good well-being. We want to be, have a good prospects. We want to be sure about ourselves, about our goals. And I think music can support us in various ways in these more, more general life uh, affairs, and especially for younger uh, children. And, um, and there are so many studies out there now who, which suggest that in kindergarten, music can aid language development, speech development, and that, um, that also there's this uh, large-scale socioeconomic panel study and um, they found that children who learn to play musical instruments from socially disadvantaged backgrounds, they have a better academic record later on in their um, education. So it does something to young children to help them um, overcome uh, social economically deprived um, situations. <clears throat> and let's, uh, Louis Armstrong was maybe one <laughs> famous example. He had nothing in his life. He was listening to radio to, to only to become one of the most famous jazz musicians um, through his love for music. And, uh, but I don't want to take this too far, but, but it, there is, it, the, the social science research or sociology research suggests that it's something in it. It's not just a, an anecdote in, in history. 
So what did we learn from the pandemic? I think we just start to learn what it does to us. We're not through it yet, and we, we it will take time to, and yet I, when you look up at, at PubMed, music and pandemic, you'd be surprised there are about 300 papers already popping up, peer-reviewed papers on music and, the, and what it has to do with the pandemic. So it's a lot of work now, and I think that's one of the burning questions, what, what, what is happening and how can cultural life, including music, help us to restore the, the, the new normal that is so often discussed. But there's a trend that we may sacrifice it more than um, we, we should. <clears throat> so the cultural techniques do not stand for themselves, but must be seen as significant parts of individual quality of life and, and psychological well-being. And we have to take this um, on board to, um, to make sure that it gets the space it needs. I, I'm hearing about the cuts of music education in the Netherlands, and the same is happening in, in many uh, German states too. And um, we, we, uh, we tend to pour out the baby with the bath. So we, the pandemic, we've learned, oh, choirs are bad ideas, uh, music ensembles is bad ideas. Oh, should we stop it altogether to be better prepared for the next pandemic? I think we should do the opposite. We should create safe spaces where whatever pandemic comes, we can safely um, play music together and, and uh, for our own and for our societal uh, benefit. So lastly, um, this is a project that has heavily suffered from the pandemic because once we are ready to go into care homes to run music interventions, with people with dementia and depression, we had to stop. We couldn't go in. And uh, we only could start in late 20, uh, 19, uh, 2021 to start with, with the interventions. And, um, and the first results from, our, from an Australian cohort that went a little bit ahead with the same protocol suggests quite uh, impressive uh, findings that it really uh, turns out that group singing is able to improve the quality of life for people living in, in care homes with depressive symptoms and, and uh, with at least mild forms of dementia. And with the, with the implication that this is a clinical trial, it's a, it's a cluster randomized trial, so methodologically it's a very high, high level um, finding. Um, so Again, it comes down to the question, what, what do we do in care homes? There's a lot of uh, pharmacological, inter pharmacological interventions. Neuroleptics are described a lot, which are actually making the dementia worse and do not have no positive effects, but they're still prescribed a lot. So the system, so to speak, the health system relies heavily on, on drugs and pharmacology. Um, not surprising, the lobbying is very 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 good and very efficient, but we don't have an equivalent lobbying for cultural techniques which actually have effects in the midbrain that can be um, as positive. And uh, the, you could talk for hours about mood regulation in dementia using musical strategies. There's lots of work out there um, to, um, to justify a systematic application of music education in, in elderly care. So from the cradle to the grave, we need uh, music in our society. And that's it. Thank you. All right. I'm curious about okay. the rhythm. Rhythm, you, you're going to get um, uh, an interesting one. Two short, one long, like this. Yes, you just, you just did a five to four rhythm. That's very complicated for a complicated talk. Uh, any questions for uh, Dr. Koitz? If you could mind walking to them the first time. Yeah. A very practical question. Could you show us the slide of Rachmaninoff again? I want to make a picture so I can play it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
other questions for Dr. Cole? Well, uh, my name is Geert John Vingeroots. I was more uh, looking for a suggestion. I once was visiting about a year ago a famous professor in Hill van den Beek <laughs> called Ad Vingeroots. And he showed me the Kennedy Center in New York, the music of the rising of Sting. And I'm using this as a last slide in my training I'm giving all over the world. And there's a chorus in it and people are getting very emotional about it. And so my advice would be put some music in your presentation like this. <laughs> <laughs> because that, that, that's, that's where the emotion is about. Thank you, Art, for giving me this suggestion of the music. <laughs> okay, one last short question. Um, your remarks about, uh, well, music and health uh, remind me of something I saw in the newspaper in the weekend that uh, going uh, swimming in cold water apparently is also good for health. And this is also not getting much attention because pharmaceutical companies do not gain anything from it. But I think as a society where we all are uh, constantly being told that health is getting more and more expensive, then uh, there might be a way to say if we can have more music, then we can uh, reduce these expenses by preventing health issues. And that may be a way for you to get more money for the research. Exactly. Middle ha did have a health economy component to calculate the costs for the singing leaders and the effects on quality of life. I think you can calculate for each improvement on an SF12, each point you can assign a number, attach a number of, of euro to that, what it, what it saves. But it turned out too difficult to compare among the various partners from Turkey to Norway, to Netherlands, to Germany and UK, to the, the systems. And it's, but it's still on the agenda. And you're exactly right. If, we, if, if anything is convincing po politics, it's... <laughs> <laughs> and if it's con convincing us for changes, it's <laughs> it's that, and it's it's a bit sad that that's the way it works, but it, it seems uh, it seems very rational and logical to go that route. Thank Which you. reminds me of the wonderful yeah. yeah or or the wonderful song of Pink Floyd, Money. <laughs> right, remember that one? That was a very good one. Uh, we are ready for the last presentation in this series. Again, and the last presentation will be given by um, Dr. Suzanne van Horen, and the Dutch van Horen, you can say that's from the city Horen, but it can also be Horen is the Dutch word for listening, so maybe that has something to do with it. She's going to talk about, relevant to the last question, to the therapeutic implications of music, and music therapy probably as well. The floor is yours, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, also for the invitation to present here my research uh, um, on uh, music therapy. Um, I'm a psychologist. I'm not a music therapist, but I'm doing research on uh, music therapy among other uh, ther therapies. Um, first of all, let me see what this is to my first slide. And um, well, when we look at uh, mental health care and also uh, our um, mental functioning, then we see that uh, there are uh, a lot of problems uh, at this moment. For example, uh, uh, Gunther already uh, mentioned uh, dementia. When we look at dementia in the Netherlands, we see that uh, within 20 years, there will, will be a doubling of the number of uh, uh, persons uh, having dementia. Uh, but also with regard to uh, depression, that uh, when you look at a lifetime prevalence of depression, then it's uh, about uh, 20 to 25 percent. Uh, so that's a lot. 
but also when you look at um, uh, uh, mental illness uh, that are work-related uh, illnesses, um, and then you see that um, a lot of the uh, problems were for living uh, long-term from work, it's stress-related or it's related to burnout symptoms. Um, and also with regard to children and adolescents, there are also behavioral problems. And when we look at our society, well, this, this will lead to high impact and also a high cost. Uh, when you look at the interventions, then uh, uh, there, are, there is uh, a lot of medication that is uh, used, but also verbal therapies. And when we look at these um, uh, methods, then uh, you see side effects, but also um, uh, some of these, uh, for example, the medications have uh, contraindications. And when you look at uh, all these uh, therapies, then a substantial number of individuals do not benefit from these uh, uh, interventions. So it's it is important to look uh, further and uh, perhaps music therapy could be an answer for some of uh, the patients. Um, but what is music therapy? Um, well, music therapy, uh, it is therapy and it belongs to the uh, experiential um, uh, perspective of uh, therapies. Uh, experiential means that uh, the experience in the moment in the moment, that is uh, very important. And uh, uh, in music therapy, um, music is uh, applied in a therapeutic way, of course. Um, but what is also very important in music therapy is that there is a therapeutic relationship, uh, a therapeutic uh, processes uh, that are, uh, are going along and that the music therapist always is uh, constantly uh, attuned to the behavior of the patient, to the, uh, its needs, uh, uh, its, um, its benefits. And so that uh, is a very important uh, aspect of uh, music therapy. Uh, and it's different from uh, music interventions, uh, such as, for example, uh, uh, listening only to music or um, uh, playing music, playing the drums, for example. Uh, uh, music therapy is embedded in, in uh, therapy programs, so it has therapeutic goals that are very uh, individual set. Uh, but it's always Im uh, embedded in a larger uh, treatment pro program and often offered in um, uh, mental health care uh, settings. Uh, uh, for example, um, uh, well, it could be in a private practice, but it could also be in a mental health care institution, but also in hospitals or, for example, in forensic care, um, but also in revalidation. And it also uh, is possible that music therapy or music therapy approaches are applied as a preventive uh, uh, tool, for example, in schools, uh, primary or secondary schools. Um, and what is also important that uh, music therapy is performed by music therapists um, who is um, educated on a bachelor or a master uh, degree. So in the Netherlands, uh, it's an uh, educational program of four years. And uh, in other uh, countries in, in Europe, it's always, um, most of the time, it's always uh, uh, a bachelor or uh, a master uh, educational program. Uh, when you want to look for more information on uh, music therapy, uh, here there are two uh, Dutch um, websites. Uh, so you can look where you, uh, here you can also find music therapists, for example. Um, but when you want to know what music therapy is, well, I think I can uh, show it with uh, some uh, short uh, examples. Uh, here is one example. Uh, this is uh, Michael Taut, and he um, introduced uh, neurological music therapy. And that is an approach in music therapy that uh, used interventions that are based on uh, neurological uh, evidence. 
And here what you can see is um, uh, this is the neurological music therapy is often applied in revalidation. So for example, for patients with uh, motor disabilities, language disabilities, attention disabilities. Um, and here you see uh, a short video of uh, a person having motor disabilities and uh, difficulty uh, to walk. Pretty pragmatic fascination example here. Oh, well, this is, this is an example of a daily application. When I show that, usually there gets a lot of. Uh, commentary among Parkinson's support groups because that's what they know so well and this is how this can be a very practical help. What you see here is that uh, the music therapist is uh, using a rhythm that will help uh, the patient to um, initiate uh, movements and this is called rhythmic uh, auditory uh, stimulation therapy um, and that is uh, used uh, that that rhythm rhythm is used as uh, uh, an external stimulus or a motivator to uh, uh, to initiate uh, movements and um, research has uh, um, looked at uh, only rhythm, uh, but it's, it has also also looked at um, uh, uh, music. And what you see is that the effect with music are uh, larger because of the motivating effect of uh, of music. Um, another example is uh, the example of uh, Save and Sound. Uh, Save and Sound is a music therapy approach that uh, is used in, uh, in schools, in primary and uh, secondary education. And uh, it's developed by a uh, Dutch uh, music therapist, Sander van Goor. And um, it is applied to uh, uh, children and adolescents with a refugee uh, background or having uh, negative or uh, traumatic uh, uh, experiences. Uh, um, and uh, this uh, intervention is um, uh, applied in classrooms, so for a whole group of children. And when it's needed, uh, when, for example, behavioral problems, uh, when a child experiences behavioral problems, then it's possible to have individual uh, sessions uh, with the music therapy and the music therapist. Um, the aim of this intervention is to uh, strengthen resilience, but also uh, to learn uh, coping strategies uh, to uh, better cope with uh, the negative events and also um, with the behavioral problems or, for example, attentional problems. Um, this method is, uh, uh, uses a solution-focused approach and is also culture-sensitive. So that is, of course, very important when you work with uh, children and adolescents with refugee uh, backgrounds. Um, uh, let me see. Well, th these are some examples of music therapy. Uh, there are many more. Uh, for example, uh, music therapy in mental health care. But uh, I think you can get uh, a bit of uh, um, an explanation of that. Um, why could music therapy uh, work? Well, when we look at uh, uh, that question, then uh, you see in the literature that when you look at the music therapy literature, that often um, it's based on the neurological models. And um, when you look at these models, then you can, uh, when, and when you compare it with verbal therapies, then um, you see that the, the models using a bottom-up approach. So uh, in music therapy, is it's very important to start with the um, bodily experiences, for example, and from that to go further to, uh, in the end, to cognitions. Uh, verbal therapies uh, start often with uh, cognitions and uh, then want to, for example, uh, use 
uh, exposure or uh, cognitive restructuring. But in music therapy, the bodily um, uh, experiences are very important. And uh, therefore, when you look at models, um, uh, well, it also goes along with uh, the other presenters, uh, um, that music therapy, um, when you look at the working mechanisms, is, it is approach, uh, proposed that uh, arousal regulation is an important one uh, because music uh, can lead to relaxation, um, uh, by um, uh, targeting uh, the, the um, brainstem, uh, lowering heart rate, uh, uh, hiring uh, heart rate variability, the release of nitric oxide, uh, leading to the widening of the blood, blood vessels. vessels. Um, on the other hand, um, music can also activate, uh, have the potential to activate uh, persons. For example, think persons with uh, uh, depression, um, they want to, uh, uh, they, they need to be activated. So then, uh, for example, using a higher tempo uh, over time in music, that could be uh, a motivator to activate uh, persons. Um, well, we already talked about uh, emotion uh, regulation. That is another uh, working mechanism that is approached from, from music uh, uh, therapy. Um, and uh, Kulsch uh, has uh, uh, very interesting uh, papers on um, the effects of music on emotion and emotion regulation. Um, so I would like to recommend to uh, look at uh, the uh, papers of Kulsch and uh, see how uh, music can um, uh, stimulate specific brain regions um, and also to uh, see how, for example, uh, prefrontal uh, regions can also uh, impact uh, more the internal uh, brain structures. Um, uh, let me see. And a third line of uh, reasoning is that music um, and music therapy uh, could uh, lead to social processes. Uh, um, music can promote uh, social interaction. Uh, for example, think on, um, uh, for example, uh, musical improvisation. Then it's very important to use uh, turn taking, and that is also uh, seen, for example, when we speak to each other. That is also very important, but uh, in music, you have also uh, uh, auditory feedback uh, um, in the moment. Um, and that could lead to also to practice uh, 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 social interaction processes. Um, uh, and music could also lead to bonding, but also lead to a higher sense of belonging. And that was also seen, for example, in our uh, study, uh, we did a process evaluation on the safe and sound approach with the refugee uh, children, and we saw that uh, there was, uh, they, they felt uh, that uh, they the, that the bonding was uh, better between the children. Uh, this um, line of reasoning is also used, uh, for example, uh, um, in, in in therapies for autism, but also for uh, dementia. When we look at uh, the effects of music therapy and uh, the specific uh, studies uh, that uh, investigate the effects of music therapy, you see that um, there is, in the last 15 years, a lot of uh, going on, uh, the increase of uh, randomized controlled trials, for example, but also single case studies uh, has increased. And um, uh, with regard to children and adolescents, we see that um, uh, we see beneficial effects for, for example, uh, adolescents who committed a crime. Uh, we see when uh, music therapy is applied that there is a reduction in uh, aggressive incidents. Uh, a reduction in hyperactivity, uh, improvement in uh, attention. Um, with regard to autism, uh, there was uh, in the Netherlands uh, uh, a single case study design, and we saw that uh, when uh, music therapists um, used their uh, specific therapy for autism, that there was an improvement in social uh, interaction, especially in, uh, more eye contact. Uh, uh, the, the children could better cope with uh, changes. Uh, they take uh, more 
initiatives, and that is very important for uh, such a disorder as uh, autism. Um, well, the safe and sound method, I already told uh, you something about it. We uh, not only saw an effect of, on sense of belonging, but also we saw that a negative effect uh, decreased. Uh, with regard to uh, the effects of music therapy for psychopathology and then among uh, adults, we uh, see uh, uh, several effects uh, on, on, on several psychopathological uh, disorders, uh, for example, uh, psychotic disorders. Uh, then when you look also at um, yeah, reviews, then you see that uh, uh, patients have less uh, attentional problems. And also what you see is that the negative symptoms, which, which is a very um, difficult to target uh, a symptom uh, uh, in, uh, in psychotic disorders, that uh, is also uh, uh, decreased. Um, on the depression, there is um, uh, some research, uh, review research, uh, where it's shown that there are uh, less depressive complaints. Um, with regard to addiction, it's uh, uh, important that the um, motivation and the motivation for future uh, treatments is increased. And uh, it is possible to use music therapy to increase uh, the motivation. Um, with regard to elderly, already uh, Gunther already told something about it. Um, we also see in the literature effects uh, for trauma and stress-related disorder, um, but these effects are less pronounced, um, and for patients with borderline uh, disorder. Um, well, when we look more from a transdiagnostic uh, perspective, uh, uh, then you can uh, look at stress and whether music therapy or music interventions will lead to a reduction of stress, because then you could also use it for uh, several kinds of uh, target groups with uh, psychopathology. Uh, and we did uh, a large review and a meta-analysis uh, with uh, 47 studies. And we saw that, um, uh, that stress is reduced after music therapy. Uh, we saw uh, not only on the psychophysiological measures, but also on the uh, subjective uh, experience. Uh, we also performed a review on music interventions so not the therapeutic application of music. And uh, when you only look at the music interventions, then you see also that there is a, a reduction of uh, uh, stress, but the effect size is a bit lower. Um, well, the last study I want to mention is a study on uh, music therapy uh, to reduce behavioral problems among patients with, uh, of persons with dementia. Uh, it's a Dutch uh, study, not an international one. And in that study, we um, investigated uh, three groups. One group received individual uh, music therapy. Another group uh, received uh, on an individual uh, base uh, music intervention. It was a listening intervention with uh, self-selected um, uh, music. And the third um, uh, group received other kinds of activities. Uh, we are now doing uh, the analysis, uh, but we see that when we look, uh, when we compare these groups, um, well, we see that the music therapy, but also the music intervention uh, can have a positive effect on uh, quality of life and some of the uh, behavioral uh, uh, pl problems. Uh, but we need to do it uh, um, more properly, so this is very preliminary. Um, well, my main take-home message is that music therapy is a valuable intervention to reduce stress, psychosocial problems, and mental health problems. But this is, of course, very optimistic. And I think it's uh, very important to do more research, uh, to do more research uh, on several target groups, uh, and, but also to look at uh, um, more evidence base for the working mechanisms and also look whether there are specific patients' characteristics that lead to uh, more beneficial effects. Uh, so I think uh, we uh, need to go further with this, uh, with this research. Uh, thank you very much.
thank you very much. This is an exemplary uh, uh, presentation of the excellent research being conducted at the Dutch uh, Open University, so thank you very much. Of course, also for her, a special type of applause. So we're going to do, we talked a bit about social communication, so we're going to use the communication in the audience. So we start with the right side of the, of the left side of the audience, and then the left, so the left, the right, your left, that side. Starts with one clap, and you guys do two. Like, Good. This is good, com good communication. So excellent. Um, uh, let's uh, have a few questions uh, uh, for Dr. Uh, van Horen. What are the effects of music therapy on adults with autism? Because you touched on children and adolescents with autism, but not on adults. Well, um, um, for adults, um, there are not that uh, many uh, studies going on. So most of the uh, studies are going uh, uh, are among uh, children and adolescents. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, I can uh, give uh, no comment on that. Uh. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your presentation, first. Um, your first to last slide about dementia reminded me of a story that I heard of a uh, friend of mine who was in a elderly home helping people with dementia, where a very particular case uh, took place where she uh, sang a song for an elderly woman who was far into the stage of dementia um, that triggered some sense of nostalgia for her. She had been very unresponsive for a long time, and after hearing this live song, she just burst out into tears, uh, looks up to the skies and uh, yelled to her supposed uh, husband who had passed away for a few years, please take me. And the double effect of this is um, she was initially going there to help her, but after hearing this, her body started shutting down and after a week she had passed away. Yeah, it's it's kind of a heavy story that I, it, it reminded me of it, which... Yeah, well, I hear a lot of um, well, case examples, uh, uh, but not uh, uh, such impressive as what you told me just now. But, um, well, I think that um, uh, music uh, could have the potential to be uh, uh, that impressive. Uh, um, and most of the time also because it gives memories uh, and um, and also the, the more basic, the bodily reactions, the arousal regulation. So I think that is uh, a, a very important uh, element uh, when using music therapy. Yeah. Thank you for that. We have time for one last question. And if not, um, then we are uh, at the end of this um, uh, sort of uh, series of lectures, of four lectures, as mentioned at the beginning. Uh, all good things in life, including rhythms, are defined not only by the activities, but also by the breaks in between. So we're now ready for a break. Uh, please don't forget there's some coffee for you guys. The speakers, unfortunately, have to move on to have a quick lunch before preparation for the impressive defense that we're going to see by Valdi uh, uh, Hanser after the break. Uh, we will see you, if those of you can make it, at 1.30 in the auditorium of the university. And for now, I'd really like to thank you for the excellent patience that you've had for us, for your wonderful clapping, and looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you.